text this evening, John chapter 14. Open your Bibles there with me if you would please. John chapter 14. Good evening church and welcome to our midweek service. John chapter number 14, and I'll begin reading in verse number 19 and read down through verse number 24 in your hearing. Let's back up and catch verse number 18. John 14, verse 18. This is the word of God. The Bible says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, Lord, for the precious word of God and the seed that is sown in our hearts through the preaching of it, the reading of it, the meditation of it, the memorizing of it. And I pray, God, that that seed would continuously bring forth fruit. We know that tares are sown by the enemy. We know that weeds are sown by this world. And there is a competition and there is a grappling, a wrestling for our hearts, for our attention and for our devotion. But Lord, the precious seed of the word of God is unparalleled. There's nothing like it. It can bring forth fruit unto life everlasting. It brings forth the fruit of the spirit. And Lord, we pray that that's what would happen. Holy Spirit, come minister, speak to our hearts, fix us, fix our families, fix our churches, fix our society. O oh God. Lord, bring revival, bring an awakening among those around us and revival among those of your people. And Lord, stir in our hearts and accomplish the will of God. Lord, get yourself the glory in these last days and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Magnify your word, help your people, strengthen us, O God, and draw lost people to Jesus Christ. I pray like never before, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord is speaking to his disciples of the manifestation of his presence. God is interested in manifesting himself to his people, of being present, and of us knowing of his presence intellectually and experiencing his uh, presence spiritually and really feeling his presence emotionally when the time is right. The emphasis is on the personal and private manifestation of his presence to the Christian. He says this in verse number 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him, to that individual, not to those, though there's a, there's a place for that, not to the group, not to the congregation, though that's obviously uh, a thing too. But really, he says, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. And so it is a personal and really a private manifestation to the Christian. But there is a question in verse number 22. Look at it with me. Judas saith unto him, the Bible says, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world. Uh, inferred in the question of the other Judas is the coming public manifestation of Christ to the whole wide world. And so the private personal manifestation and then the coming public manifestation. Consider with me what we'll call the threefold manifestation of Jesus Christ. The threefold manifestation of Jesus Christ. This includes a past manifestation to his disciples it includes a present manifestation to us, Christians, and then it includes a future manifestation to the world. First, we see here that there was a past manifestation to his disciples. Look at verses 19 and 20. Jesus says this, 
Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. This manifestation focuses on the Lord's resurrection. He says, because I live, ye shall live also. It, it focuses on the Lord's resurrection and on his post-resurrection appearances to his disciples. Luke records the following for us in Acts 1, 1 to 3. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to, to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself, it means to manifest, he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, notice, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Paul would later tell us in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and 6, that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. His post-resurrection manifestation to the disciples, to his people. The Lord told his disciples, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. After his death and resurrection, they indeed saw him. They saw him on numerous occasions, and they saw him in various settings, and they saw him in varying numbers. Cephas saw him, the Bible said, and then the twelve saw him, and then he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. But the world didn't see him. The last time this world saw Jesus was when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took his body down from the cross and buried him. The last image this world has of Christ is either dead on a cross or dead in a tomb. And the Lord himself tells us in Matthew 24, 29 and 30, write that in your notes, Matthew 24, 29 and 30, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then, and then shall, a, shall, the sign, shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The next time this world sees Jesus will be when he manifests himself to the world. John tells us every eye shall behold him, they also which pierced him. He's coming again and the whole wide world is going to see him come when he comes at that time. And so we see a past manifestation to the disciples. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. Hey, but ye see me. Then too we see a present manifestation to Christians. And this is what applies to us really today. A present manifestation to the Christians. But the theme is the manifestation. The theme is that Jesus is not hiding. This thing was not done in a corner. God wants to be known. He wants to make himself known. He wants to be actively involved in the lives of his people. Not just as a theological idea or concept but really involved personally involved in a manifest in a seen and appeared way look at what he says in verse number 21 a present manifestation to the christian verse number 21 he says this he that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father and i will love him and will manifest myself to him then again in verses 23 and 24, look at it with me. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my, <clears throat> and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. While the past manifestation to the disciples was a post-resurrection physical manifestation, they saw him Tom, in so much that Thomas was able to put his fingers in his hands and his hand in his side. And Jesus said, Behold, look, I'm manifesting myself to you. Behold, it is I. Be not afraid. And there was that past manifestation to the disciples, which was a post-resurrection physical manifestation. And this manifestation... The present manifestation to Christians is a spiritual manifestation, a manifestation that is through the resident spirit of God and then it's related to the word of God. 
Much has been previously said concerning the resident Spirit of God, and that was the subject of our last message two weeks ago on this, from this text. This manifestation of God to His people through the Spirit is hid from the world. They cannot see it. That's why there's confusion. That's why there's doubt. That's why there's disbelief. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. And we have the Spirit of Christ. We have the Spirit of God. And they cannot know, but we can know. And it's a confusing thing to them. But it's to be a, an empowering idea and an empowering influence in our lives to us. This manifestation of God to His people is hid from the world. The Lord says in verses 16 and 17, and we'll back up and pick up just a little bit of our last message. And I will pray the Father, He said, and He shall give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, notice, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth Him not, neither knoweth Him. But ye know Him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Lord manifests himself to us through his spirit that is in us. God, when we get saved, moves into us. Oh, miracle of miracles and mystery of mysteries, that God, uh, whom the heaven of heavens cannot contain, moves into the sinner who repents, turns to Jesus, accepts by faith the gift of salvation that God offers to every person in the entire world, receives it by faith, for by grace are you saved through faith. And then God's Holy Spirit, in a way and in a manner that only God can do, moves in to that believer. I remember it. Do you remember it, Christian? I remember it very clearly, April the 2nd of 1996. I was at my grandpa's funeral, and I was lost, and I was undone, and I didn't know what life meant. I didn't know what the meaning was. I thought, what's the purpose of it all? I'd lost my hero. I'd lost my grandpa, the one that raised me. And then on that day, a preacher stood and preached the Word of God. He simply at a funeral preached the gospel. And the gospel seed was planted in my heart. It began to germinate, and just in a matter of moments, uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes, however long it was before that service was over, I was miraculously and instantly and forever born again and was given power to become a son of God. And I received the gift that God was offering me. I had no background, no foreknowledge in, in scriptures, but I knew that what that man was preaching was the truth. And at that moment, when I said yes to the God who had already said yes on the cross to me and the grave to me and in the resurrection to me, when I returned the yes back to Him and I said, yes, Lord, I'll take you. Yes, Lord, save me. Yes, Lord, forgive me. Yes, Lord, wash me. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. At that very moment, the Spirit of God moved in and He began to do a work, an internal work on the inside that not too long thereafter began to become evident and noticeable on the outside but it was an internal work it was a work in the inner man a work that I could not describe then and cannot really understand now except that it happens and God is faithful hey God is faithful and he does the same thing inside of you he's with you and shall be in you is what Jesus told his disciples he was with them in in the person of Jesus Christ the Spirit of Christ with them and then Jesus said, I go away. God's going to, the Father is going to send you another comforter in my name. And he's going to be in you, not just with you, but in you, working from the inside. And I thank God for that internal working of the Holy Spirit. The Lord manifests himself to us through his spirit that is in us, the resident spirit of God. Then too, this manifestation is related to the word of God. And oh, church, we need our Bibles. In these last days, I think we have more of a need for the Bible, maybe, than any other time throughout history. And we've always needed the Word of God. Job, way back, and he was way back, he was pre-Abraham. Job said, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. But I think for some of us, myself included, there are times, there are ebbs and there are flows. Thank God for the peaks, thank God for the awakening, thank God for the revivals. Uh, but sometimes there are slumps and there are dry spells and we kind of back off of the Word of God or we don't approach it with the same fervor and the same passion and the same intensity and because of it we suffer 
We don't esteem it more than our necessary food. Hey, the greatest necessity that a man has is his necessity for the Word of God. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4 4 and in Luke 4.4, 4, quoting from Deuteronomy 8.3, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hey, do you need life? God has it for you in His Word. Do I need life? Do I need revival? Do I need life again? Uh, God has it for me. God has it for you right here in his word. He says, seek you out of the book of the Lord and read. And he says, give attendance. Paul said to Timothy, give attendance, pay attention to reading, uh, pay attention to reading. And when you're reading, pay attention to what you're reading and let the spirit of God speak to your heart and breathe life into you. It's the word of God. What is the breath of God? It's the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathe. Open your Bible and let God resuscitate you. Let God give you CPR and that we may be revived and brought back to life. We need to return to the Word of God in these last days. Listen, I know that there are a lot of preachers out there today and excuse this small rabbit trail, uh, but it's a good one. There are a lot out there today and the temptation is even here in, in my own pulpit there are a lot of preachers out there today that want to give their opinion and their view about social things, about cultural things, about this and about that. God never called a preacher to stand up in the sacred desk in the pulpit and give his opinion and his philosophy and what he thinks. And by the way, I have an opinion and I have a philosophy and, there, and I do have my view and my perspective and there is what I think. But he just called me to stand up like he has every other preacher that's God called and preach the word. Just stand up and preach the word of God. And... Let come what may, you as a man stand up and proclaim the word of God and let the spirit of God do the rest. And so that's what we are called to do. It's related, church, to the word of God. His manifestation is concerning the resident spirit of God that lives in us and it's related to the word of God. As the Lord says in verse number 21, look at it again. He that hath my commandments, notice, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, any Bible student that's been a student any amount of time knows that when he says commandments, that that is a synonym for the Word of God. And we look at Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, if we can call it a chapter because it's a psalm. But it has more verses than any other, 176 in the 150th, in the 119th Psalm. And then what we find is this, every verse is dealing with the Word of God and he uses synonymously and interchangeably word, thy word, thy statutes, thy commandments. Thy nor and, uh, and he uses all of these different things synonymously and he's talking about the Word of God when Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What he's saying is keep my word. If you love me, Christian, keep my word. And right here, what he's saying is this, he that hath my commandments, or he that hath my words, and keepeth them. He it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest, will manifest. Here's what I will do. I will, if he takes my word, and he reads my word, and he memorizes my word, and he lives in my word, and lives my word, here's what I'll do. I'll manifest myself to him. Judas asked in verse number 22, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Look at verses 23 and 24 again as I read them with emphasis. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Notice that love to God is connected to and tied to inseparably to keeping his words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. There is a direct correlation between our keeping of his word as a result of our love for him and his consequent, notice, manifesting himself to us. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Those who never give heed to the word of God can never know Christ and have a relationship with him for faith cometh by hearing. You have to 
We cannot have the faith to believe except we hear the Word of God and the Spirit does His work through the preaching, teaching, reading of the Word of God, sharing of the Word of God. There's a direct correlation between our keeping of His Word as a result of our love for Him and His consequent manifesting Himself to us. He says this, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, those who never give heed to the Word of God can never know Christ and have a relationship with Him, for faith cometh by hearing. Those who know Christ, but who subsequently neglect to know and keep His commandments, though they be saved, yet can they not know daily fellowship with Jesus Christ. The permanent presence of the Spirit of God in the believer is a result of our salvation. When you got saved, and when I got saved, God moved in, He moved in to stay. He changed His permanent address uh, to you, and He changed it to me. And so, God lives there. He's there forever. He will send you another comforter that He may abide with you forever, forever. And when God says forever, what He really means is forever. And so, the permanent presence of the Spirit of God in the believer is the result of our salvation. The promise here in our text concerning the Spirit is this, He shall abide with you forever. This promise for the Christian is the unconditional result of our salvation, no conditions have to be met except we, we get saved, except we are born again. And then he moves in. That's it. He just moves in. But there is another promise here that is the conditional result of our submission. The Lord says this in verse number 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Someone said it this way. Salvation means uh, that we're going to heaven. Submission means that heaven is coming to us. Uh, we see this truth illustrated for us in the account of Abraham and Lot in Genesis 18 and 19. Now, we know we have the record. And looking back, we know that Abraham was a child of God, chosen by God, saved by God. Abraham believed God. It's counted him for righteousness. But there was another one that believed God. There was another one that was saved. It was his nephew. It was Lot. And we know that Lot was saved too. And the truth of the manifested presence of God in a fellowship, in a communing way, is, is illustrated for us in the, in the lives of these two men, disparate men. Uh, but they're men nonetheless, and they were related, and they both knew God initially and were saved. Uh, Genesis 18.1, look at it with me. We'll just look at some verses. And I would encourage you, maybe following this message, if, if, if you have the time or can make the time, to go ahead and read all of Genesis 18 and 19. Obviously, for time's sake, I won't do that now. I'll just read really three verses. Genesis 18, 1 first. The Bible says this, And the Lord appeared unto him, that is unto Abraham, in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. The Lord appeared to Abraham, came to where Abraham was. And aren't you glad God knows where we're at and that God comes to where we are? He went to where Abraham was. Let me add a verse. Let me add a verse. Verse number three, Abraham said this. Let me add two verses. I'm sorry. I can't help it. He lit, verse number two says, And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, there stood a man by him. And when he saw them, there stood uh, three men. Um, let, me, let me start over. Verse number two, and he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, notice, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. He saw them, and the Bible says it's the Lord. And verse number three says, and he said, my Lord, that's an all, that's capitalized. That's, he knew who it was. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ, a Christophany, they call it. And the Bible begins by saying, and the Lord, in verse number 18, uh, ch chapter 18, verse 1, and the Lord appeared unto him, unto Abraham. And when Abraham saw him, he knew who he was. He, he said, my Lord. And notice what he did. He ran to him. When there's a manifestation of the presence of God, the Christian ought to run toward it. Listen, here's the thing. We're either running to God or running away from God. No man can just stand still. There is no static Christianity. We're either moving in the direction that God is moving or we're moving counter to that direction. Jesus said, uh, they that are not with me are against me. 
And he that gathered not with me scattereth abroad. We're on one side or the other. Abraham saw Jesus, and you know what he did? The Bible says he ran to meet him. He didn't just, hey, Jesus was coming to where Abraham was, but as soon as Abraham caught sight of him, you know what he did? He ran to him. We can't get to where God is, but when God starts to show up where you are, run toward him. James said it this way, if we draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to us. And we can't draw nigh to him because we don't know where he is until he manifests himself to us. And as soon as he manifested himself to Abraham, Abraham began to draw nigh to him and he drew nigh to him. And then they had fellowship. Now go to verse number 33, 1833. And the Lord went his way as soon as, so God, now he's going to leave. He came and now he's leaving. But notice he doesn't leave until what? And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham. And then Abraham returned to his place. And so here was a sweet time of communion. Now, the presence of God is always with us. And, and he manifests himself to us at very, to various degrees at various times. And you know, you'll have those moments of sweet fellowship. And then the Lord will depart. Now, his presence doesn't leave us. But the felt presence may be the experiential presence of God that sometimes God allows us to have. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and then God will have those seasons with us. And then he'll go his way. And then it says Abraham went back to his place. You see, we are to be in our place. And sometimes God will come to where we are and then we run to meet him and he'll provide fellowship and communion, the Bible says, refreshing and revival. And then he'll withdraw a little bit and then we go back to our place. That is our God-given place, our ministry. And we begin to serve based on the communion we just had with God. Whoo, that's good right there. And then chapter 19 in verse 1. It says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face to the ground. Now, it's interesting that in chapter 18 and verse number 1, dealing with Abraham, that there were three. And then if we would have read the chapter, we would see that while one stayed back, the Lord Jesus Christ, and communed with Abraham, the other two were sent down there to deal with Sodom, where Lot was. And so the Lord did not manifest himself to Lot. He did not commune with Lot. Now, Lot was saved. We know he was saved. Uh, we're going to see that in just a moment. When the Lord Jesus and the two angels visited Abraham's tent, they felt right at home. They enjoyed a meal together. If we read the chapter, we find out. Uh, Sarah went to baking and Abraham went out and got a fatted calf and delivered it to the young man. He dressed it and made them savory meat and they communed together. And the Lord communed with Abraham. Uh, the, the word means to fellowship. The Lord Jesus, because of Abraham's obedience, had fellowship with Abraham and he manifested himself to Abraham. But when it came to Lot, the Lord sent the two angels, but he didn't go himself. He didn't manifest himself to Lot. And we know that Lot was saved because Peter, in recounting these events, says in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8, that God delivered just Lot. The word just means justified. Vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man, there it is again, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, vexed, notice, his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. While Lot's salvation was secure in Christ, because he refused to submit to the Lord, he forfeited the fellowship with Christ that Abraham enjoyed. I don't want to just be saved. Thank God I'm saved and nothing can change that. Church, I need that fellowship with Jesus Christ. I need that communion. Oh God, you know I need it. And you need it. And all of God's people know, need to know what it is when Jesus just comes by our tent door and just visits with us and fellowships with us, has a meal as it were with us. Feels at home. Oh God, make my heart a place where you can feel at home. Would you pray that for me and with me? God didn't feel at home with Lot. And so he didn't even go by. He just sent the two angels, but he didn't go himself. Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. He it is that knoweth me, and he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself unto him. We see then a past manifestation to his disciples, a present manifestation to Christians. And then lastly, 
we see a future manifestation to the world. A future manifestation to the world. Look with me at verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? The disciples, really throughout much of the earthly ministry of Christ, had anticipated his coming kingdom. You know, with what Jesus has previously said, and we preached on it two weeks ago about the indwelling Spirit of God, you would think that maybe they would have had some clues. Maybe they wouldn't have had to ask this question if they were really paying attention to what Jesus was saying. But just like you and I, we kind of have our own ideas about how things should work out, about how things will happen. And throughout much of the earthly ministry of Christ, the disciples anticipated His coming kingdom. The crucifixion of Christ didn't fit into their theology. Their focus wasn't on Christ alone. The Lord Jesus, after His death and resurrection, joined Himself with two of them as they walked to a village called Emmaus. Do you remember that? You can turn with me to Luke chapter 24 if you like, or write it in your notes and read it later. It's a long chapter, but it's a good one. And we won't read it all. I'll just start in verse number 15 and read down through verse number 21. Luke 24, 15 to 21. It tells of these two disciples that were walking, and oh, they were sad. Jesus joined himself to them and walked with them. Let, let's read. 24, 15. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holding that they should not know, that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned and to death and have crucified him. But, notice what they say, but we trusted, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Interesting that they said, we thought that it would be He. We trusted that it would be He that should redeem Israel. They're talking about redemption. But they're not talking about redemption like Paul talked about redemption. They're not talking about redemption like you and I talk about redemption. He did redeem Israel. And He redeemed the whole world by dying and sacrificing Himself that vicarious death in our place in the place of every sinner shedding His blood for the remission of sins. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. No remission, no redemption. So yes, he did redeem. But that's not what they were talking about. They were talking about setting up the kingdom. They were th talking about, when, th when they said redeem, the redemption they were talking about meant overthrowing Rome, overthrowing the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisaical and Sadduceical rule, and restoring the kingdom back to Israel. That's what they were talking about. That's what they wanted. And they said, we trusted that it had been he that would have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They saw the glory of the kingdom. Oh, they saw it. They kept wanting it. They wanted it so badly. but they failed to see the suffering of the king. And both are clearly presented in Scripture. It's interesting to me how too often we see what we want to see. I want to do something, and so I began to dig, and I ignore the things that would kind of discourage me from doing what I want to do, and I really cling to those. You know, God gave me a verse. Actually, I, I had to read the Bible seven times through to get this verse, to find one that would fit my agenda, but, but I finally got it, and I ain't even looking at the rest. And you know you're the same way that I am sometimes, and God deliver us, and God help us, and thank God that He's long-suffering, and that He doesn't deal with us as our iniquities deserve. 
Jesus calls them fools for this and slow of heart to believe, notice, all. Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Then we read in verses 26 and 27, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then just prior to his ascension as recorded in Acts chapter 1, the disciples asked him this question in verse number 6, Acts 1, 6. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Notice where their hearts are. He's died. He's resurrected. And they're thinking, okay, we didn't see any of that coming. And that kind of caught us off guard. Okay, now let's get back to our previously scheduled programming and agenda. Lord, uh, is now the time that you're going to restore the kingdom? Because that's really what we're interested in. That's really what we've been waiting for. You know, there's all this other stuff about the Sermon on the Mount and all this stuff about this and that and all these different things. And then the crucifixion. Boy, we didn't see that coming. The arrest and all that. We never saw that coming. And then the resurrection. Whoo, we never saw that coming. Uh, but now that we've gotten past all that stuff that we didn't see coming, can we get back to what's really important to us? Lord, wilt thou at this time restore the kingdom? I mean, what they're saying is, are, 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 we, are we done wasting time? Are we finally going to get around to what we're really interested in? Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I'm troubled by the idea presented repeatedly that they were looking past the king to the kingdom. There is no kingdom without a king. Hey, our focus ought to be on Jesus Christ. Thy kingdom come. Emphasis on thy. <laughs> hey, they were wanting a kingdom for themselves. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Thy kingdom come. That's where the emphasis is. There is no kingdom without a king. They were more concerned with the timing than they were with the task. The Lord Jesus responded to them in verses 7 and 8 of Acts chapter 1 by saying this, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. And aren't we consumed with that? Oh, someone will post a video or have a conference about end times and we're trying to get in there and get the charts and the diagrams and the time timeline and timetable, all of that. And so many are so interested in eschatology and all of these things. And when Jesus said, hey, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Power is an interesting word here. And he said that God put the wind power, W-H-E-N, God put the wind power in his own hand, which he had put in his own power. That's God's business. The wind, W-H-E-N, is God's business. And then he goes on to say, but ye shall receive power. And so now we have the power of the wind, W-H-E-N, that, that God has. That's God's business. And then we have another power here. And he says, and ye shall be, uh, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Notice, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The wind power belongs to God. The witnessing power, that's what God's give, given us power for. Witnessing, going into all the world. He left us with the great... And, and uh, the great commission, the last and last lasting command of our Lord, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth, and, and so on and so forth. We have the various commissions presented the various ways, but they all say the same thing, witness, 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 and I'm going to give you power to witness. Don't worry about when, we're about witnessing. Don't focus on the wind, focus on the witnessing. The wind will come soon enough. And when it does, it will be forever too late for many. Oh, for too many. Back in our text, Judas is confused because he as the, and, and the other disciples are still looking for the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. And this prompts him to ask the question, Lord, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? I mean, don't you think when you come in in the parade and we're all shouting, Hosanna, Glory to God in the highest, and we're laying down palm branches. Don't you think somebody might pick up on that? Don't you think when you ascend up, you, when you defeat the Romans and ascend up and take your seat on that throne, don't you think maybe somebody might recognize that and see that? I mean, how are you going to hide that? Don't you think whenever the, the crown is put on your head and your servants bow at your feet, don't you think maybe they'll pick up on that and see that? How, how in the world are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? What he's really saying is, how in the world are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel and the rest of the world not know it? And he's still missing it. 
He's still missing it. There is coming a future physical manifestation of Jesus Christ to the entire world. That is coming. That he didn't manifest himself to the world then and that he hasn't manifested himself to the world now is a show of mercy on his part. Because when he does manifest himself to the world, it will be in judgment. It will be in judgment. The Lord Jesus manifests himself to his people and in particular to his church and we are in turn to bear witness to this world that they also may believe on him. Do you know that I'm saved today because a preacher, a child of God, a servant of God, of this king, had his focus on the king and not just on the kingdom? And when his opportunity came to preach a funeral, the people he didn't know, he responded. He sensed the spirit leading and he went. And because he obeyed, I heard the gospel. And because I heard the gospel, the Spirit of God worked in my heart. And because the Spirit of God worked in my heart where I was in my life, I said, yes, Lord, yes. And God saved me. God saved me. Hey, he's given us witnessing power. Witnessing power. He wasn't going around that preacher looking for pre funerals to preach or, or, you know, whatever. He was just being sensitive to the Spirit of God. God opened a door. He walked through it. I got saved. People in my family got saved. And God has used my life and others' lives as a result of that preacher's obedience. And thank God for it. And thank God for him. The Lord Jesus manifests himself to his people that we may bear witness, in part, that we may bear witness to this world that they also may believe on him. The more fellowship we have with Christ, the better it is for us individually, the better it is for us congregationally as a church, and the better it is for this world. Oh, we need a world saturated with Christians that are in fellowship with God, that are in communion with the Holy Ghost. Because this is true, the Lord says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The personal and private manifestation of the presence of Christ to the Christian is among those things which are needful in the avoidance of troubled hearts. Remember, this whole section begins with Jesus saying this, let not your heart be troubled. That's the key, that's the pivot point. And then he proceeds to lay out conditions by which he will manifest himself to us. Christian, the answer to a troubled heart is fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I will manifest myself to you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your promise. Give us a love, would you a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God, that we may know Your commandments, love Your commandments, keep Your commandments by Your grace, and enjoy that sweet fellowship and that sweet communion. And then, when You go away, we would go back to our place and serve You, O God, and then quickly return back to that place of com communion, and then back to service, and then back to communion, and then back to service, that we may have constant fellowship with you through your spirit that we may be effective witnesses in this world servants of God children of God friends of Jesus thank you Lord Jesus that you consider me and that you consider us your friends thank you that you are a friend of sinners that you laid down your life for us that you are a friend that sticketh closer than a brother and that loveth at all times. Thank you, precious Lord Jesus. Now I pray for any who hear this message, who do not know Jesus Christ, who are not saved. Lord, would you draw them by your Holy Spirit in their hearts, O oh God, reach in and draw them and tug them, that they may be saved, that they may submit and surrender to you. O oh God, help us. In these last days, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. May the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.